Today I'm going to tie up one last loose end in the context of mens rea, uh, specifically this category we call mistakes of law. Uh, so what is a mistake of law? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, it fits within the general area of ignorance of the law is not a defense. But the important thing before even delving into the details here is to recognize how unforgiving our legal system is, particularly under the common law, for people who make mistakes about the law. And this is different than the mistakes of fact we talked about in our general common law mens rea. Right? Our defendant in State v. Green uh, you know, was confused about whose hogs they were, or at least there was a reasonable doubt he was confused. Uh, and so when he thought those hogs were his and they weren't, uh, the law would say you know, he's probably not guilty and he should at least be afforded a specific intent instruction that means if he, there was a reasonable doubt as to whether he made an honest mistake, he should be found not guilty. Mistakes of law are not treated at all in the same way. So returning to the maxim that defines this area of the law, ignorance of law is no defense at all under the common law approach. The NPC softens that a little bit, but not an extreme amount. This is still a very unforgiving rule. Uh, but I want to first uh, conceptually divide, divide two different types of mistakes of law. This is not a, a distinction the law recognizes, but I think it's helpful to recognize that there are two different types of mistakes, one of which everyone agrees defendants should not get any break, they shouldn't get lesser culpability. But the second category, maybe we might wonder if our system is a bit too harsh. So the first category is, is, is and for example, is somebody goes out, kills five people uh, without reason, just goes and does it. And then when they're arrested, they say, I didn't know murder was illegal in this state or this country. That sort of ignorance of the law is just something incompatible with uh, our legal system. Uh, we have an expectation that people have a general awareness of the law. We can't you know, consistently provide actual notice to every single person and ensure their comprehension of the law. It's just not how our system is designed. Um, and so that sort of ignorance, where you don't even know there is a law and you, you, a core crime you just basically ignore, that's something our system just cannot forgive the way it is um, put together. But the second category is a little trickier. These are cases that emerge where a defendant actually seems to have a plausible or reasonable view of the law, whether they knew it ahead of time or they only know it now that they're being prosecuted. You know, that might matter. Certainly doesn't to the NPC, but we're not getting, they're not there yet. Um, and in this case, it may even be that many judges who hear the case actually agree with them, but at the end of the day, they lose, say at an appellate court, the high court level, and um, that sort of mistake, well, it seems like maybe we should be a little more forgiving there. After all, they had a view that many judges agreed with, that lawyers agreed with. They may have even consulted other trained professionals in this area. And our criminal law treats it the same, right? In other words, the common law in particular is unforgiving. And the NBC, which I'll describe in a second, um, doesn't really offer much in the way of... Um, uh, any breaks for defendants in this case. So mistake of law, if, you're, if your defense is considered a mistake of law, um, you're doomed. Um, that's really the end of the discussion uh, under the common law. Now, as I said, the NPC softens it a little bit. Now, in truth, there's no jurisdiction adopted the NPC. So for our purposes, we'll just use this New Jersey statute, which was inspired by the NPC, but is different. Um, it is qualitatively different, and even what it focuses on. Um, but it does include some of the key aspects of the NPC. So we'll treat the New Jersey statute as our sort of NPC proxy. Uh, so it says a belief that conduct uh, does not legally constitute an offense is a defense to a prosecution for that offense um, based upon such conduct when, one, the statute defining the offense is not known to the actor or has not been published or otherwise reasonably made available prior to the conduct alleged. This is basically a, a narrow, narrow situation that almost never applies in our modern era, where in between the actual enactment of a statute, usually through a legislature, an executive putting it into law, it's just not publicly available. This sometimes can still happen with city ordinances, which, you know, even, you know, the, the bigger cities are often slow to put it up on their websites or to publish it in print. And so, yes, it exists, but this is not our core concern here. But it is at least one of the two ways here. The second one, and this is where the MPC was influential for New Jersey, the actor acts in a reasonable reliance upon an official statement of law afterward determined to be invalid. So that's where you see they, they thought that their view was right, but then eventually a court decided it was wrong. And it could even be the trial court in that case. Or erroneous contained in. And then we see four different um, possibilities here. A statute. 
Uh, so that's pretty rare, but if you have conflicting statutes, I guess it can emerge. A judicial decision, meaning there's precedent on point, uh, and this we'll see in the Iowa case how this plays out under the common law versus the NPC, uh, opinion, judgment, or rule. An administrative order or grant of permission. Uh, so this is where we focus on the executive uh, branch uh, there, then what they could do. This is particularly true uh, at the federal level. Certain crimes are defined um, not just based on statute, by subsequent regulations uh, that are published. And so an administrative act or grant of permission relevant to those regulations can uh, fit within this sort of category. But since New Jersey is only dealing with New Jersey crimes, it's, it's only dealing with New Jersey administrative acts. Um, and then D, an official interpretation of the public officer or body charged by law with responsibility for the interpretation, administration, or enforcement of the law defining the offense. So this category here you know, can include a, a few people, but importantly, not everyone within the executive branch. Uh, so even within, say, a district attorney's office, not any DA can give an official interpretation of a law that a defendant could rely on. It have to be somebody who's charged with this particular area of crime. Right. If it's a sex crime prosecutor, they can't interpret a drug crime. So, you know, there are going to be people who fit under this executive umbrella, but not everyone. And so in these instances, uh, under the MPC, uh, a defendant can argue uh, they are not guilty. Um, and, you know, they don't come up that often, but we'll look through our cases and then return to this MPC uh, and think about how they would be different. Um, so the New Jersey statute, for our purposes, will essentially be the MPC. Okay, so we have a series of cases here, and this is one of the few times I like to use older cases. Um, you know, there's, uh, the book emphasizes um, in recency modern uh, cases, uh, but the reason that mistakes of law older cases I like a little bit better is twofold. Uh, one is, uh, they're often pure, meaning there's not as much confusion about which way the law should be. The opinions are often focused on much more limited, narrow issues, uh, just because of the time and the way judicial opinions are written. So it's one area where I like the, the cases just to be a little bit cleaner. But the second thing is I also think it's good when looking at mistakes of law to take yourself out of your current frame of reference, um, because that helps situate you in sort of the defendant's worldview, which is to them, this law seems crazy or foreign or or it just doesn't seem reasonable for it to be applied to them. And lots of the modern cases are situations where you all, you know, already have maybe some information and you're too much in your comfort zone. So the Hopkins cases, the Iowa cases are good examples of where you look at it and you have maybe that same strange reaction defendant does. So it, the law has not substantively changed here under the common law. So I, I use a little older cases and just wanted to explain why. So the first is Hopkins, right? Hopkins, uh, Reverend W. F. Hopkins has put out signs uh, in his Maryland business, um, and he nonetheless is, pro well, I guess because of those signs, not nonetheless, is a prosecuted for basically advertising marriage services. And you might wonder, well, why is that? Well, we could talk a little bit about that class, but for our purposes, it's enough to know there's a law here that says you cannot advertise marriage services. And since Reverend Hopkins does give marriage services, he wants to be cautious here. And so he, he takes a proactive step. He goes and consults uh, the prosecution's office, the state's attorney, and says, are these signs okay? And it's important to even look at what these signs are. One just says Rev. W. F. Hopkins. That's it. Uh, another one um, is the same sign, but it's illuminated at night with electricity. So it's just his name with Rev. attached. The third, well, it has a little more information. It says W. F. Hopkins, Notary Public Information. Still not quite advertising marriage as I can see. And the fourth sign is actually just the third illuminated at night. So we have a total of really two signs of substance and then two illuminated versions. And at the end of the day, you know, you could see why Hopkins would already think that, you know, these are not advertising marriage services. Talking to the state's attorney who said they're not, you know, marriage services. And yet he's ultimately prosecuted and he's found guilty and that judgment's affirmed. And so, well, how can this be? I mean, how, how why shouldn't he be able to write? Well, you know, there are policy reasons here we need to think about and explore in class, but we just want to understand that the rule's unforgiving here. You might say, well, why did the same office prosecute him? Well, it's not always the same office, but even if it is here, you change, you get turnover. Um, sometimes it's because of elections, sometimes it's just career, uh, you know, civic servants uh, just sort of retire or leave or go get another job. And so, yeah, there's, there's a change. And um, that change, for whatever reason, uh, means that Hopkins is in a tough spot. 
And so when you look at the site, you might say, but how do you advertise marriage services? Well, you know, that's an argument he gets to make to the jury. And he lost it. The argument that he was mistaken as to the law, well, that's something that's just considered to be irrelevant under our modern doctrines. That's one example there, pretty unforgiving rule. Um, the Hopkins sign, I couldn't find an exact version of, but I at least found notary public, uh, and well, marriage is permanent and shotgun dousing. Right? He doesn't have any of those, right? He has notary public and information, and yet that's still deemed sufficient. It might be that the rev is the key part here, right? The fact that he is identifying as somebody who can perform a ceremony uh, might have been sufficient in the jurors' minds. Um, but let's go to another case and go a little bit further back in time to Iowa. Now, I spent a lot of my life in Iowa. You know, I went to undergrad there, I clerked there, I was even married to my wife there. Uh, I've lived there for many years, and so um, it gives me no great pleasure to say that this is a very low moment, in my opinion, for um, the state of Iowa and the High Court of Iowa, because the reasoning in these two opinions that are coupled together, it's not the finest moment for them. It's, it's definitely, there's some, some reasoning here that we might look at and say, wow, they've really thought that? But again, I think that's helpful to take you out of your comfort zone and put you in this different circumstance. So our defendant here um, has purchased for his restaurant uh, a device, uh, and it's a gum or mint vending machine, uh, which sounds pretty innocuous, pretty, pretty normal. Um, you'll notice the salesperson, though, is giving some extra information here. It doesn't just complete this transaction say, I know there's a big gambling crackdown going on. There's anti-gambling laws. So in case you're worried this is a gambling device, I offer you three things to show it's not. Right? I have a letter from the mayor of Des Moines, right? That's the high, you know, highest person in the executive branch who has power potentially over um, both the administrative rules and prosecutions. Uh, the second is I have a certified copy of a court opinion, a lower court opinion that says this is not a gambling device. And third, I have a letter from uh, a prosecuting attorney for our state's attorney in Des Moines as well. And so this seems like pretty good diligence done to, to you know, make sure this is not a gambling device. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, our defendant is prosecuted despite all these things. Uh, he is convicted. The conviction is upheld by the High Court of Iowa here. And this, as I said, but again, puts you, you're like, really, a mint dispensing machine? Well, let's look at that factual question then first before we get to the legal one, because that's, that's really what emerges in Ellis. Um, Ellis was, you know, around the same time, and so I wanted to show you the reasoning the court was relying on here in their sort of analysis. Um, and this is where I think the Iowa court is, um, I don't know, uh, they're a little confused about things in the world. Because you might wonder, why? Why is a mint dispensing machine considered to be a gambling device? Now, some students have hypothesized, well, maybe they're using the mints in place of poker chips. No, no, none of that. Read the opinion, right? They're not saying that. There's no evidence that these are being used for, uh, as a proxy for other gambling monetary units or something like that. Um, but let's look at the paragraph uh, on page 142. Um, it's the second full paragraph. Well, I guess it's the, the first really big paragraph, the second full paragraph, because I've edited the first one down to a sentence. The machine in question reported to be used for sale of package of, uh, a sale of mints and packages. These packages were retailed at five cents each through the use of the machine. It is a slot machine. Well, that characterization brings to mind gambling, but it's a little conclusory and not clear why. But I don't think that's where the, the case is decided. The nickel goes into the slot, see the slot part, and the purchaser pulls a lever. So yeah, there's some physical resemblance here to a slot machine, but it's still kind of strange to think of them whereby the mint package is delivered into the hand of the purchaser. This result is invariable. Now this seems pretty important, right? Invariable, we don't usually associate with gambling. In addition to the package of mints, chips are sometimes delivered also. These chips are metal discs, which are stamped as being good for five cents in trade, uh, which is basically the value of a, th a free mint, right? In other words, every time you get one of these chips, you get the value back in your mint. You got a free mint. Um, these chips furnish the allurement of the game. In order to avoid the appearance of chance in the game, an indicator is provided with this machine, which indicates to the purchaser in advance just that he will be received by pull of the lever and deposit of a nickel. So even when this, this chip for five cents is available, it's an invariant event based on notice, right? In other words, the machine specifically says you're about to get a free one, so you obviously want to play. Um, it play, uh, as the court would think here. Um, 
At the first lever of play, the purchaser is usually advised by the indicator he will receive nothing but a package of mints. The first pull of the lever sets the indicator, however, for the next play. It may indicate for the second pull of the lever the purchaser will receive a specified number of chips in addition to the mint package, or it may indicate that only a package of mints will be received. It is a question of chance at this point. Not quite sure that's chance, but okay, you're, I guess the, the, the one pull away from the one you're doing, which is not the one you're currently paying for, there is some question. But before you ever put a nickel in the slot, you know that you're either going to get uh, a free uh, chip or possible chips, although the court is, is sort of assuming um, that there's possibility for more here. Um, if the indicator fails to promise chips for the second pull, such promise may uh, be where there it is for the third pull. The promise is sure to come if the lever is pulled and the nickel drop a few times successfully. So they see this as a game, <laughs> a game of mints and getting coins. Now it's true if this they were ejecting tons of chips and the mints were only there as, you know, just sort of like a garnish uh, for your pay, that would be different. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case, right? And, um, you know, one thing that is lost in the, the opinion that I've edited here is they actually do have a diagram of the device. And I think it's fair to say the Iowa Supreme Court is a little confused just about how this device works. Uh, it's as though they think it's magic. Um, they think that when a coin uh, enters there, sometimes slang might come out and sometimes not. But it's really just a very mechanic, simple mechanical device. But it's, it's, it's magic as far as the, the judges are concerned here. And there's no evidence, in fact, that this is in fact being used for gambling. I mean, it's possible this could be a, a clever way to uh, try to avoid gambling laws, but there's a reason why another court said it wasn't. There's a reason why the mayor said it wasn't. There's a reason why the state's attorney, but ultimately the Iowa Supreme Court disagreed, right? They say there's this, perhaps a sufficient description and indication of the lure that is hidden in the operation of this device. The player pulls the lever not simply for the package of mints promised by the indicator, but for the supposed option of the next pull if the indicator promises a prize. Uh, you'll also notice that this was the same um, holding of uh, the High Court in Missouri, so uh, this is something that, um, and, and eventually it went to 22 different states. Uh, so yeah, the Iowa court's not alone here, so I can't mock Iowa alone. And it's true, there is a lot of paranoia at this point about gambling, but the mint dispensing device is a strange one to fixate on, um, especially because the court does not indicate they ever get a flood of chips or that people are gaining money from these machines. It seems like you just get a free mint. Um, but nonetheless, this is the rule, right? So whatever the Iowa Supreme Court decides here, that's what matters. Now, why do we ignore the rest? Well, there is a little, I mean, I've edited some of it out, but there is some sort of arrogance in the way the Iowa Supreme Court uh, um, addresses this issue by basically saying, until we've spoken, there is no final law. Uh, we are the high court. Technically, the U.S. Supreme Court could uh, hear an appeal, but not on a state law issue like this. So this creates a problem, right? Because that means you can't even rely on lower court opinions, even if there were dozens of them. It all said your conduct is completely legal until the high court speaks, and then when the high court speaks, suddenly you're that one test case that, you know, or if you're in the system already uh, waiting to go through it, you, you suddenly find that you're on the short end of things, and the law will be unforgiving here. They similarly discard the state's attorney and mayor's notice here as well. Um, and so this shows, again, the harshness of uh, the rule, and uh, the common law does not... Um, you know, offer any any defense argument here. They don't get to argue to the jury that these they were relying on these things. I had already accidentally skipped ahead to the next slide, so hopefully that didn't confuse things. Uh, but moving on from our three older cases, I just want to highlight that this problem becomes bigger the larger our criminal law grows, right? So the more, you know, detailed, intricate, um, you know, crimes we have to find, uh, the more likely we're going to have defendants that are making mistakes because it simply becomes unreasonable for anyone, even trained lawyers, to know all the aspects of all the laws. Now, maybe certain laws which are targeted on specific populations or industries, well, they can be on notice, but any journey or applicable law is uh, inherently problematic uh, for this mistakes and the unforgiving rule of the common law. But the common law does not adjust in this area. It is not. The, the ignorance of the law maximum is held strong. Um, and uh, so let's, there, there is one limitation though, uh, constitutionally to it. It's not much of a limitation, uh, but it's embodied in uh, Lambert v. California. So Lambert v. California uh, involves a registration statute wherein a defendant uh, in, who was punished uh, or, uh, by, for, or convicted or punished for a felony in the state of California 
um, and takes residence in the state of California uh, must uh, basically provide notice uh, that they are a convicted person to the local jurisdiction and uh, they have to do so if they stay for any period more than five days. Um, and it requires any person having to place a boat outside the city to register if he or she uh, comes into the city on five occasions or more during a 30-year period. Well, Justice Douglas, who you might remember from Papa Cristo, um, finds this, this law to be unconstitutional under a due process new notice rule. Now, his, the exact test that comes out of Lambert is, um, you know, not precisely defined, uh, but it, 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 you can pick up the pieces here, uh, particularly the last sentence of the last, or the first full paragraph on page 145. But the principle is equally appropriate where a person wholly passive and unaware of any wrongdoing is brought to the bar of justice for condemnation of criminal case. So it's important here, the conduct of the defendant is wholly passive, meaning they did nothing. They sat on their couch, right? Or they were watching TV, whatever they were doing. It was not that they were engaged in affirmative action. We might think of this as, in a minimum, a crime of omission, but it might even be narrower than that. It might only be certain crimes of omission um, that are applicable in this. So that's, that's one criteria. And the second is they have to be unaware or wholly unaware. If you think wholly modifies unaware, which is actually how later courts have done it, uh, typically, um, then we mean you don't have not, not just notice, but you have no sort of constructive notice. There's no reason to think you should know in these cases. Um, and because that seems to be the case with Lambert, it's unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause, and uh, the statute is struck down. So this allowed a defendant who was ignorant of the law, in this case the registration statute, um, to um, not just argue that their mistake of law should be a defense, but actually it bars prosecution, right? So it's a constitutional limit. And so this applies to the common law rule as well as the NBC. So we haven't actually delved in the NBC, but a constitutional rule will always apply across all jurisdictions. Now, the dissent here by Justice Frankfurter uh, remarks that this is basically an outlier, this is, they don't like the rule, and in many ways, and, and we'll talk about this more in class, I think Frankfurter's right to say that this was sort of an outlier. And even though the Supreme Court has still cited it here and there, even in the last 20 years a few times, it doesn't seem to have had much effect. Lambert challenges are almost never won. And of course, you might have heard of a certain form of registration statute, sex offender registries. Um, and they, despite some initial pushback from certain courts, uh, and I was involved in a couple of those cases helping out, um, it, they've lost everywhere at the appellate court level. And so we'll talk about why in class. I'm going to leave that hanging for now. I want you to think about, well, why? Why is this statute unconstitutional, but all the sex offender laws we have across the United States, how have they uh, been upheld? Um, so this is a limitation. Uh, but generally, the common law, in most of our cases, ignorance of law is not going to be a defense. It's just, in this narrow case, a constitutional bar to prosecution, um, which is slightly different than saying it's a defense or it's a, a mens rea issue at all. Um, so, the, well, okay, well, let's think back now, um, going through the MPC here. How would our cases turn out differently? Would they turn out differently? Um, well, it's not clear that they, you know, it's going to depend on some facts that we always have. So Hopkins, for example, went to the state's attorney's office. The one question we'd have under the New Jersey statute is, was the person who gave uh, the information signing off on the signs, didn't mean to double use sign there, um, was that person of the type that fit the, the sub D criteria of um, the New Jersey statute, that it is an official interpretation of the public officer body charged by law with the responsibility for the interpretation, administration, and force of law. It, it can't just be somebody in that office, it has to be somebody who would be, be responsible for administering or prosecuting cases um, under the sign ordinance. And if so, then yeah, Hopkins would actually have an argument there. Uh, what about the Iowa cases? Well, the Iowa cases, you can see, which would definitely come out different, right? Because we had B, uh, a judicial decision. Uh, C, probably is the mayor's uh, statement there. And D, again, assuming the person is responsible for prosecution, we'd have three of these things. And so the MPC would reach different outcome in that case. The Hopkins case is a closer call. As I said, Lambert is exactly the same in either jurisdiction because it's a constitutional rule. Um, so we do not have to worry about uh, the specifics of the statute there. So that's our basic mistake of law rule. It's, it's very harsh. The common law affords um, no real uh, escape. Uh, the NBC, you know, in truth, very few jurisdictions have adopted it, in, in, even any version of it. New Jersey is an outlier here. So, but for our purposes, the NBC at least offers a window for defendants in specific situations uh, to uh, be able to escape liability. Um, 
So, yeah. Oh, and I should say that, you know, one thing that, that is, um, you know, is is troublesome in this broad area is not just the complexity of law, it's not just the passive defendants, but the fact that in many cases that we haven't looked at here, as I said at the very beginning, lots of judges will end up agreeing with the defense argument. But if they're not in the majority, suddenly that view is just as though it was, you know, it didn't even exist. The defense didn't have an argument. And that is a bit harsh, right? To say that we don't even offer defense if the view is reasonable, and it's so reasonable that many trained uh, legal minds think it's reasonable. It's still, you get no break. Uh, so that's it for mistake of law. It's sort of a discrete unit in our broader uh, mens rea um, chapter. And it finishes our, our discussion of mens rea. So be ready in class to, uh, if you have any questions from the entire chapter on mens rea.